Our first, first speaker would be Caroline Alderson from GISC Collections, UK. And uh, Caroline, the floor is yours, as simple as that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Carolyn Alderson. I'm from GIS Collections in the UK. I'm representing a consortium um, of UK higher education institutions. There are around about 160 to 170 universities. And we represent um, their requirements. We manage the consortium. We negotiate their agreements for them. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, really are looking at usage statistics and publishing data and metadata and talking about why we need them in the context of those agreements that we're doing which relate to open access. So I had um, already indicated that I'd be talking about this. Oh. Okay. <laughs> it disappeared. Um, really focusing in on how by using this usage data and the um, for usage data and APC data, looking at two publishers to some extent, how this can inform us around the value of agreements that we have in place or that we're planning to have in place, and also thinking ahead around metadata and how that also features in the picture here and how important it is. So again, this is around the transition to open access and we should remember that open access is not an event in itself. We're just moving to open access. It's taking time. There are many things to consider and in the UK it's very important. And it's important for the UK because there are some mandates in place that say UK researchers must publish open access. Um, the feeling behind this is that through moving to open access, it will provide a large impact for the UK economy. It will also mean that you say UK researchers' research is more highly cited, and there will be greater access for researchers and students to content that they need. So, as you know, probably many European funders require open access for journal articles and conference papers, and certainly in the UK, this is very important. And I think it's important as well to think about um, the transition to open access as being about relationships with publishers and relationships with all the parties who are involved in helping the transition work. And I'll come back to that. I also wanted to add about the importance of repositories in this picture of open access. As part of the mandate in the UK, the Research Council UK requires that funded research is made publicly available through a repository. And this is for science, technology, engineering and medicine subjects, it's six months and 12 months for AHSS subjects. And how that actually happens in practice is quite an issue that needs to be talked about, discussed and worked through and this involves metadata again. And in July recently we had the policy for open access in the post-2014 research excellent framework and this requires researchers to deposit publications into their repository within three months of acceptance in order to be eligible for the REF this actually came into effect from the 1st of April. So JISC, company I work for, is very much involved in how this, to make this work, how to make this effective because the government is mandating that. And I did want to say something about the transition to open access in terms of emotions, relationships and pain points, particularly pain points which I'll come on to. The mandates um, have generated a lot of discussion. People have different views. It's also been, in a way, um, a window of opportunity for some publishers to 
perhaps generate more business, um, look for opportunities to grow their business uh, as well. Um, and so from when we set out to where we are now, there are still lots of issues in the picture, and I think some of these will be talked about later. And so the different players in, in this um, whole event reel, as we're moving in the transition, are, are many and various. In the past, just collections really dealt with publishers, but now it's funders, authors, the institutions, the librarians, different people within the organizations, intermediaries and publishers. All of these feature really when we're thinking about what a good agreement is, when we're looking at what we need to do when we come around to renew an agreement with a publisher. And the pain points that really feature in this relate to constraining costs and the compliance of open access. So those two things, if you get them right, means that it's then possible to realize the benefits of open access. But constraining costs and looking at open access compliance issues really do involve quite a change of direction in the discussions we have with publishers and providers. But it's only by making the change that everybody will benefit. That's my opinion, is that we're all players in it and we all have to look at what our own responsibilities are and how we can make the changes in order to move ahead and really fulfill what we're trying to achieve with open access. It's not really happening on its own. There's quite often we, we look to other people, we say if they did that, then this would all work. They need to change, they need to do this. I think it's much more complicated than that. So I'm going to look at, um, firstly, how we might think about constraining costs. What GIS Collections has done, has used APC data for to predict costs, excuse me, to review the value and savings from offset agreements. Um, and for those perhaps maybe not so familiar with offset agreements, this is where we're really trying to offset the cost of the subscription against the cost of paying for APCs in an agreement. So we can predict what um, an, an agreement might cost by looking at APC data and predict the cost. We can then review the value and savings from the offsets <coughs> agreements that we've got in place. And then perhaps we can also test the effectiveness of a new model. And I'm going to look at these three areas now. So when we use APC data to predict the costs for open access, this was something we did back in 2013 as we were setting out on our journey for open access. Using the APC data that we had at the time, we were able to predict what the cost of the subscriptions would be and what the cost of the APCs would be at the rates that publishers were charging at the time. And then it was possible to see from this diagram that in the UK, many institutions would be paying more on APCs than they were paying for subscriptions. Now, although um, the funders in the UK have provided money for this, in many cases, it's not actually enough money. And to add that in 2018, it's not clear yet whether the funding will continue. So, we are predicting at this point, back in 2013, that it's not going to be sustainable if we have both in the picture. And GIST Collections was tasked, if you like, to negotiate offset agreements with publishers on a test basis, experimental, to see how they would work out. But in truth, it, we moved from experimental to actual, really, in about 18 months. So what started out as being quite um, novel has become quite established now for the UK and other countries when, when they're in the same situation. And I wanted to show you some quite recent data that we have um, received in just in the last week. 
uh, from a colleague of ours, Stuart Lawson, who used to work for GIS Collections and is still doing some work for us in assessing the offset agreements that we have put in place. So these are for Wiley, Taylor and Francis, Sage, IOP and the RSC. And it's not all the data, I just must stress that. So these figures are not actuals, they're a sample of 34 institutions who provided APC data. And what we have here is the estimated subscription spend, and I believe this is in the public domain anyway, so I'm not telling you perhaps anything that isn't already there. But remember, it's, it's not the whole of the GIS Collections Consortium who are subscribing to this agreement, to these agreements. It, it's actually the 34 in the sample. And then there's also the APC spend showing in the second line and then the total. There's also an estimate of the number of APCs in the deal and the amount estimated for the offset. So this is how much we think we've saved, if you like, through having this offset agreement in place with each publisher. And all the offset agreements are different. So there's no direct comparison between each publisher. They all operate a little bit differently. And, um, and you can see that, you know, that they do look quite different as well. So the bottom line there is the discount on the total cost of publication. And the funding, um, the data, the APC funding source was from three main areas, RC UK, COAF, which is essentially the Wellcome Trust, and then there was institutional funded APCs as well. So again, we're not just looking at one source and there is not total clarity here because the way the data was provided was, was quite different in each case. So this information will be made available publicly, but I, I just wanted to, you know, to stress really that it's, it's not necessarily the actual. Um, but one thing you might note from this is that when you look at the APC spend to subscription spend, um, the RSC is pretty high up there. It's pretty well about 50%, 51, 52%. So you can see that in that particular subject, uh, there's a lot of APC expenditure and, and that, that then becomes quite problematic just looking at that on its own. Subscription and APC spend looks very, very high. With Wiley and IOP, I think it's about 20% and then with TNF and SAGE, it's much lower, perhaps reflecting that there are more humanities and there, are, there isn't so much publishing at the moment, open access expenditure on APCs. So you see we need that data and we will be continuing to collect that data and reporting on it, but we now do have a standard template. So next year it should be easier, it should be cleaner data, we should know, have a better understanding. But it is still a challenge. Um, we still don't find it easy to know the total number of gold open access articles, just, just simply a total whether it's from our own institutions providing the data or from the publishers, some of them. Um, the proportion of gold open access in hybrid journals, so the ones that are on the subscription model, and also the total of gold open access articles in pure open access journals. This should be something that's really quite easy to do, but it's not. And it's very important when you're trying to work out the value of an agreement to understand the differences So just going back to the information I showed earlier, we feel we're estimating that the value of those five offset agreements at the moment is about two and a half million pounds. But with Elsevier, we don't have an offset, so we're not able to, to provide any, any data there. Um, but with Springer, we have had um, a test model in place. Um, but that happened after we started to collect this data for the five publishers, so that's why they're not included. But I am going to talk about Springer now. And when you look at um, 
what might be the best model, really, when you're thinking about this issue of subscriptions and open access APCs? Probably the most effective model, predictably, is one where you pay more or less the same amount for publishing and then you have access included or for a small fee. So it's flipping the model and countries that actually have the mandates who are mandated to publish open access and also have quite significant historical print spend, this is the model that works quite well predictably for those um, countries. And it's also predictably easier to manage because it can be managed at um, a consortium level, paying a single amount. And it means that if everything is open access, then everything can be published within the required time frame with a CC BY license. So overall, it, it hits that pain point of cost management and constraining the costs. And so that's the agreement with Springer at the moment is, is looking at that. And there are other countries as well who have got this in place. Netherlands, Max Planck Institute, Austria and Sweden are all piloting it. And, and as I said, really, it's the funds that were paid for subscriptions now fund open access publications in Springer hybrid journals. And then there is an additional what's called a transition fee that allows for access for, to all the content. And so, so far, um, that, that is actually looking quite good as we assess this model. So just to look at it visually, you can see that before in the standard model, we had a subscription price and then APCs that would just be added on and on and on. And in, to the, to the right-hand side, you can see that in the flipped model, it's capped. So the APCs are capped when they get to a certain point and we're not paying any more for that. And when you see it at country level, you can see that if a publisher moves from country to country at consortium level, you can gradually move everything to open access in a very managed way. And to show you some of the figures that have come through the analysis so far, um, this is UK open access and non-open access articles. If you look back to the left-hand side, November 2014, the blue is the non-open access and the pink is the open access. So as you move towards the right and, and to May 2016, you can see that uh, open access publishing is increasing. And I have to say that some institutions, some libraries, some institutions are still actually publishing on the subscription model. We're not quite sure why. We've got to get to the bottom of that. Because really they could just publish totally on open access. And here's another slide that shows you the value of the APCs and the percentage increase per month. So the value down the left and the percentage on the right hand side scale. And it varies a little bit through the year. But you can get the full information then about what's actually being published through this type of feedback. And what the one I found quite interesting is um, the UK articles by subject. So you see medicine has the most published articles within Springer Compact and only two for history, not surprisingly. And again, just visually to show you that difference between how it was when it was a subscription agreement and then how it's changed. Now it's just easily available for authors to publish in the Springer journals. So there's no barriers for them. They're not having to pay APCs. The APC's already been paid up front. And it is interesting that their output has increased in the Springer content. So why is that? That's something that we need to investigate further, whether it's the same in the other countries as well. Um, has it meant that if you take away all these barriers and adopt this model, that a publisher will actually see researchers publishing more in their journals? So, so that would be good. At the moment, there's a, you know, the cap works. Obviously, the citations will increase for, for these researchers. Um, and the publishers are seeing 
researchers deciding to publish in their journals. So in terms of um, the effectiveness of this model, when looking at the, um, if you're totaling up the expenditure by APCs to May, there were 78 institutions in the agreement and we estimate that um, their APC spend was 3.7 million euros. And in fact, as of July 2016, the article value is up to 4.7 million that have been made openly available. And they're made openly available immediately upon publication with a CC BY license. So that means they, or it suggests they are all compliant with the policies that we have in place. And as I said, the articles published in the first five months increased by 25%, the total. So this is um, a model that is also discussed at consortium level who meet the consortia involved in different countries who have this agreement, meet with Springer, Springer Nature now, and discuss and discuss it, discuss what works, what might could, could be improved, what, what might be changed. And it's a real relationship in that sense. So it provides, if you look at the value proposition here, a sustainable price with increased publishing at no additional cost. It's also one agreement, so that cuts out some admin and some bureaucracy. Um, the open access is covered centrally by the university, so the authors don't get stuck in that um, that issue of payments, and it's OA compliant. I wanted to talk about thinking about constraining costs, perhaps looking more at the subscription side of it and thinking about usage data, because of course in an offset agreement, the subscription part is still there, and in some of the agreements, some of those earlier agreements that we looked at in terms of the savings, it may be that we're still talking about those elements of subscriptions and APCs, which, what part gets discounted, for example, where is the value. So we can use the usage data to assess the value of the content in a big deal. In the context of how that, con how that content relates and is being used for the institution's research, teaching and learning activity, we can also identify lower content across the consortium as well as high usage. The lower usage needs to be identified. So when you look at a big deal, quite often you know, a publisher is likely to say it is tremendous value, you're getting an awful lot for, for the price. All those journals that are licensed when you look at what journals are most used in the UK, when we're looking across our consortium, we find it is a much smaller number. When we look at, I'm just using one particular publisher example here, but actually it appears to be the same across all the publishers with big deals. And then there are the journals outside the big deal, and there may be some subscribed titles there that an institution takes that they have to take, but they're not in the big deal. So they shouldn't be forgotten because there is a cost to that year on year with a maybe standard subscription price increase. So how, how well are those journals used? You would expect them to be well used if they have been picked purposefully as extra subscriptions. And there's also the gold open access um, articles in journals that the UK publishes and you would expect them to be well used because they're relating to the research output so you would expect them to be used continuously to support future research. The same with those gold um, hybrid journals within the big deal. Some of them will be very well used, some of them perhaps not so well used. And then there are those articles <laughs> that are published by the UK authors that have to be transferred into repositories that are on the green model and they will be well used. So you can see here that, here are the repositories, so you can see that it's, it's possible to drill down to the detail of this to really, and now that open access is in the picture, to really understand within a big deal what is valuable 
and also what's not included in it from outside. And I think we're, this is more than we used to do. We're, we're having to think about this more. And if I look at an example then of a big deal consortium usage, and it is an example, um, we can see here that there are 502 titles that account for, um, sorry, there are 530 titles that account for the top 75% of usage. And then the next 10% account for 227 titles. And then the bottom by usage, and this is across the consortium, is 1510. So you might think then that there are quite a lot of titles that have little value at consortium level. Actually, at institutional level, some of those titles might be very, very important. But when you're trying to think about a consortium deal and what's the best for the consortium and for that agreement, it really, you know, it, actually identifying your top titles is very important in the, in the discussions that you're going to have. Um, because actually, is, is the value really there? Are you paying more than you need to? Um, for the bottom 15%. How is the agreement structured? How is the pricing arranged? In the UK, so many of these deals relate to historical print spend. They're not a true database agreement where pricing is across, across the whole database. And one of the things we can also think about, in, in the UK we use JISC bands for agreements. Um, for most of our data set agreements, but not particularly for our journal agreements. And so one of the things that we can do is look at the institutions within their band allocation, which relates to affordability and how much funding they get for research and teaching, and then just see how the usage relates to that. Is there a parity between the percent of usage and the expenditure within the GIST band? And we can find here that there is, with small differences. But this can tell us that things are looking fair across the whole of the consortium. We also sometimes undertake a further analysis of usage. This is just for one institution, perhaps, that found that 86% of their article downloads were for pre-current year. So how much is really current, current usage and how much is past usage? These, these are things that we, we look at. How much duplication of cost might be factored into the current year pricing? And what might be the cost per download for just looking at the current year data against what you're paying? So this might make it actually come out quite an expensive agreement. Um, much depends on things like post-termination access rights in the picture. And now I'd like to talk about um, the admin side of it. So we've looked at actual costs of APCs and subscriptions and thinking about the value there. But with open access, there is also the compliance that needs to be put in place, what the, the funders want, what they have to um, see reported on. And in order to comply with what they want, then we have to implement open access, both for gold and green. And this very much depends on metadata. So JISC is actually supporting the whole of the compliance, as it were, for institutions through various um, services that we're providing. And in the middle there, you can see deposit in repository. And, and this is a key thing that we have to do in the UK. And to help with this compliance, to have publishers help and because publishers aren't responsible for the mandates that have been put in place but in order for institutions to comply we really do rely on publishers taking this on board and seeing that this needs to be done and that perhaps for the UK it's not only the UK it's other countries as well so to try and broaden this out beyond the UK saying we need this for the UK we have been looking to work with um, the UKSG organization in a more global context, looking at the standards that we have developed with our uh, 
consortium of um, librarians and universities, 13 recommended standards that we've come up with that we would like publishers to adopt, which will help authors and institutions to implement global access, global open access. And it really is about best practice, and we've been working with the publishers, it involves Crossref, it involves um, ALPSP, STM, the Publishers Association. It involves Taylor and Francis, um, F1000, and OUP. They're all on the working group, along with JISC and RLUK. And we know that this type of activity is going on in other parts of the world as well, so it would be good to, to join it up. Um, and publishers want to hear that. They want to know that it's something that isn't just something for the UK. And the type of requirements that we're looking at are listed here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through them all, but one of the key ones, of course, is to adopt ORCID. And in the UK, we have got that in place as an agreement. For the institution needs to have um, notification of a DOI of the accepted manuscript and that so um, is about registering the DOI on Crossref and Crossref features quite largely in this list really because they are so important in the process so I, I won't go through them all but you can see that we have information about article level open access licensing terms and journal level open access licensing terms and embargo periods and effectively this all relates to metadata being of a standard nature being clean being something that we can be transferred easily and that everybody agrees needs to be done so being able to upload a copy of an accepted manuscript into the institution repository at the date of acceptance actually is quite complicated in terms of what a publisher is being asked to do. But many publishers are engaging with this now. Um, it, and, and as I say, the working group is, is looking at how that can be disseminated more globally. So again, number 12 there, the key dates in metadata the date of the final acceptance, the date of publication, and the start and end dates of any embargo period. They are really important pieces of information. And to help with this um, in the UK, we just has developed the publications router, which is um, helping institutions to capture their research articles onto their open repositories. And so we are working with um, a few publishers at the moment, but, but talking to a number of publishers around how they can send the, the um, metadata through to publications router and then that allows us to push the data through to institutional repositories. So you can see it's eLife, PLOS and Springer Nature. And we have institutions in the UK involved in the pilot. So this is a diagram of how it works. Publisher sends a notification, the metadata and the text to publications router, and then it's pushed on to the repository or CRIS. And the idea then is to automate that process. At the moment, in, able to, in order to do all that, it's very manual. It involves a lot of effort for institutions, um, and there's a lot of differences between what, what is being received. So the idea is this will make it easier for everybody um, many authors still actually, who are meant to be publishing with a CC BY license, request a different license because they're not blocked from any, you know, they're allowed to do that. I mean, what we want is to ensure that they only have the possibility to, to take a CC BY license. That's what we're aiming to do. Um, and that cuts out a lot of errors then and fixing errors and costs both for publishers and for institutions that's just one example so this slide just gives an example 
of the metadata that's being provided. And very recently, we've been thinking through what a publisher-assisted green OA metadata requirement lists would look like, because this is needed at both the deposit of the author's manuscript um, on acceptance, and also then the update of the record when the final version is created. And you can see the list of what should be in the metadata, what should be required. And it sli changes slightly then, the DOI showing on the right-hand side for the update. Um, some of it is the same, but if anything has changed, needs to be updated. So those two points are quite important, um, acceptance and publication, final version. So, talked about costs, constraint, and, and metadata, and I just wanted to go back to that requirement then, when you're OA compliant, you have to provide full data about your APC outputs, and we've seen at the beginning how difficult that was. Um, that's why we're developing JISC Monitor. So this is in development, but the idea of this is that we are helping institutions to monitor their expenditure and of course, with better metadata, that should be a simpler process all round. So the type of reports that can come through when this is sample data, um, so don't take it as truth. <laughs> this is um, some universities who are participating, providing their data. You can see in this one the number of APCs paid by publisher for a particular institution. In this one, you can see expenditure statistics by institution, UCL, my colleague Paul Eyre is sitting here, he will recognize the huge amount of APC expenditure. And open access versus hybrid is another way of thinking about this. Um, as you can see, most of it is in hybrid journals and as, we've indica as I indicated, this is a pain point area in the discussions with publishers. There's far more being published in hybrid journals than pure gold. And this one um, is an indication of gold publications for which green would have been available as well. So that's quite useful to know when the funding dries up, if it does. So finally, just to summarize, I wanted to talk, I have talked about the pain points that are involved for um, libraries who are moving to open access and what would make a value proposition better for them, more attractive to them particularly for hybrid deals, thinking about how the costs can be constrained, the absolute costs and the administrative costs, how compliance can be achieved through good metadata and publishers and libraries working together to actually agree what, what that requirement is. And those two in place then will really ensure that the benefits of open access can be realized accurately, that articles can be discovered and there will be an impact through the open access route. So I'd like to thank you for listening. And I don't know if there are questions now or later. Clear as mud. <laughs> okay. No? Thank you, okay. Thank you. Thank you.